There's the, um, the charge sheet from the 20th of February. Can I read the charges? Yeah, yeah, basically. On the 12th of February 1993, Bootle in the county of Merseyside, you unlawfully took or carried away James Patrick Bulger against his will. On the 12th of February 1993, at Walton in the county of Merseyside, murdered James Patrick Bulger. Police searching for a missing two-year-old boy on Merseyside believe he's been abducted. James Bolger. I've had a turn left. I'd have got James back. The idea that it could be done by juveniles or even children was, you know, it was off the scale. Was he able to talk? Yeah. James. Yeah. What did he say to you? I had 24 years police service at that time. I've arrested quite a few kids, but I've never dealt with a child who has committed murder. This could be any child, you know, it could have happened to anybody. I remember just feeling sick to the pit of my stomach. I thought, oh, please, God, this can't be true. I'm Michael Fergus, James's brother. We shouldn't be looking at him on the news about a kid being murdered. He should have been here with us. Still now, I can't really fathom think about exactly what happened. I don't really want to know all the details about it. We have a spare chair around the Christmas table. It's always been empty. I shouldn't have let go of his hands. It is hard for me to say, but it's the truth. I shouldn't have let go. I've always lived in Liverpool. Um, I think it's a great city. Basically, like one big family, you know, we all look out for, for each other. You know, it, it's just it's just an amazing place to be. Even back in the 90s, it was the same. When I lived in, well, everyone knows Kirby, I think, yeah, not far from my mum, it's, it's, I'd say a two minute walk from my mum's. So the area was really nice, nice area to live, people were so friendly. Nice little flat, wasn't big, but you know, that's the way I wanted it. I had my, my little family in there. Always wanted to be a mum. Um, coming from a big family, I was one of the babysitters anyway, so I was always minds and one of the kids, uh, which I always loved to and always loved being around kids. I couldn't wish for anything better at that point. James was loved by all. But as he, he started taking more and more steps, he didn't then walk into a room he run into a room. You knew when James was there because all you see him was the, the blonde bouncy air running as he run past you. He wouldn't leave my side, really. No matter where I sat, when we were all in my mum's, no matter where I sat, James was always on my knee. He loved to make people laugh. He was a little character. It 
it was a really cold small I did put a big thick coat on him, his hat, his gloves, scarf, everything. A girlfriend of my other brother comes walking in. She says, I'm going to Beatles Strand, do you want to come? So I won't be long, I'm just taking something back. I went, yeah, I'll come with you. The buggy was in the hallway. That's the only time I left that buggy. I never left that buggy anyway. Whether I folds it up and carries it under my arm, I never left that buggy anyway. That was the only day I left it. That was the biggest mistake of my life. The Strand Shopping Centre in Bootle is uh, probably the only shopping centre in Bootle, actually. It's, it's been there since 1966, I think, and it was beginning to show its age a bit in terms of um, the exterior and some of the shops were a bit run down. I was actually the beat officer for the Strand for about a year, so I got to know all the shops and all the set out of the Strand really well. The Strand itself was very, very busy. I think it was probably used by everybody in Bootle in terms of the, the shopping. We were long in the strands at all. On the way out, I decided to stop off at the butchers to get that night's here. We were going home from there. But James was starting to run all around the shop and I thought, this is not good. Um, trying to catch him, I mean, he was a lot quicker than me. They're like little dodgers, aren't they? And I had holes of his hands, and within seconds of me reaching for my purse to pay for the chops that I had bought, I uh, looked back down, and that's when I discovered he'd gone. I've run into the reception and, and said, you know, your little boy's gone missing, and he said, OK, we'll put it over the tannoy and um, we'll get, get the words out there. I decided to continue looking for James myself. The thing that was in them shops then was all these rides that you put money in, because James loved them rides. And I thought, I'm going to find him on one of them. So I went to every rise in that shop. I was getting told uh, certain shops has them on, certain floors. So I was going to that shop and describing them. No, we haven't got them. So and so's got them in their shop. So I was running to that shop, I was getting told the same. The longer it gets, I mean, I think even a minute of losing your child seems like an hour. It, you, you, your head's just all over the place. You just want sight of them, you just want to grab hold of them. I got a call saying that um, there's a child missing. Being on the Strand, you get a lot of missing children. You would normally sort of just finish putting details in your pocket notebook of the child, alerting the radio room as to what was going on, and then the child would be found, and that would be the end of it. As soon as you hear them words, police are getting called, and you know it's serious. 40 minutes when I got there was always was quite a long time before we even started went into the Strand. Denise at that time, obviously, she was very, very upset, so it was quite difficult at times to, to make out what she was saying and to, and to sort of keep her on the, the details that we needed from her. She, she wanted to say, like, get, let's get out there, and I'm saying, no, we need, we need things off you, we need some details. I do remember when I met Manzi and she was trying to calm me down. Come on, I'll walk around with you, and let's see if we can see him. Oh, Manzi, he's not in here. I went, he's not, I've, I've looked everywhere, I've been in the car park, I've been everywhere, he's not in here. Well, I was trying to sort of find out what sort of little boy James was, you know, would he, would he go with someone, was, it, was he sort of friendly? Did he know his name and address and things like that? You know, would he be able to sort of give his name to anybody if he was stopped or anything? And, and whether or not, you know, he would, he was the sort of kid who would wander off on his own or not. 
It was getting late on as well, started getting dark. You start getting more and more worried. Um, with him being so small, he didn't know the area and, you know, I had visions of him being out there somewhere in the dark, freezing cold, and I just needed to get him back. You have this thing, this golden hour where you're searching, and James had been missing for about 40 minutes, so already we'd eaten into that before we even started, so things started being geared, geared up at the station, people were coming out. We had the traffic cars out using the tannoy system, sort of giving out the messages. We then gave the, all the details to all the taxi drivers, they put it out over their systems. All the bus drivers were told. I had dealt with missing children, nothing on this scale. I can remember actually what the, the call. It was, it was an unusual call because they were informing me about an incident that would generally not be escalated to the CID. The scale of the investigation, even prior to my arrival, was significantly higher than you would expect. But this wasn't a normal situation. The helicopter had been out. The operation support division, they were actively engaged in the search. All of the available officers in Bootle were involved in the search. We don't treat it as anything other than a missing, a missing from home, and, and, and on the balance of probabilities, uh, James is going to be found. And we stayed on the strand for quite a while, and then eventually we decamped back to the station because there was nothing we could do, and Denise really, really didn't want to go and could tell, you know, I mean, the, obviously, um, there wasn't much we could do for her in terms of sort of calming her down, because by that time he'd been missing three hours. The shops are shutting. The police asked me to go to the police station. And I did find it really hard because I thought once I leave here, yeah. it's, it's leaving that place, it's leaving that point of where you last seen your child and you're leaving that shop without them, but you walked in with, with them. And it, it's just such a hard thing, it was such a hard thing for me to do. I didn't want to leave it. I wanted to stay there until I got him back. I wanted someone to bring him into that shop and go, he's OK. What I asked for all of the, uh, the key holders for every shop of the Strand to return to their shop. They're just short of 200 shops, so we had to get 200 people back to the Strand and get the, the stores open. James had gone missing, quarter to four, and he hadn't been seen since. So there's a strong possibility that he's wandered into one of the many shops. TJ Users was quite close uh, and, and he's hidden. And as the key holders were contacted and arrived, we would then go through, they would go through every single shop and basically do a thorough search. You get one go at you know at going in there and doing it properly. I was really, really worried about James because of the proximity of the canal. That was my big fear, actually, at that time, is if James had been wandering, uh, and the thought of, you know, access to that canal is, is relatively easy. The Operational Support Division had a full team of 18 constables, two sergeants and an inspector. At that point in time, we were actually searching as best we could, given the light we had. We were searching the canal. My eyes was everywhere. I felt like it was just going to explode. Yeah, I thought, you know, this has got to be serious now. I remember one of them walking in with a pair of old shoes. 
never said anything to me, just stangle them in, in my face. And I went, no, they're not James's. I don't think they knew what to say or were they blaming me. I, I, I don't know. I really don't know. I just remember them walking in with these shoes, dangling them in front of my face, me saying they're not his, and off they went again. We had to interrogate the CCTV system. About 10 past one, we were still there, and I got, I got a message from one of the detectives who said he'd seen something on cameras that he really wanted me to look at uh, as soon as possible. This was a, a time-lapse system. It was 16 cameras. I think it was taking an image every three seconds. Clearly, you could see James hand in hand with, with, with two other boys um, being led away uh, in, in the strand. You had to look twice because it was surprising. And I remember having to think, what does that mean? It, 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 was, just, it was just something I, did, I just didn't expect to see. From that moment then, the focus and the priority has changed. We knew that, that, that James hadn't walked out of the Strand alone. He had walked, or had been certainly uh, guided away from, uh, from his mother by two other boys. It was an abduction. Denise finds James missing at something like just before a quarter to four. She's looking round for him. In less than one and a half minutes, James has been led out of the Strand. James is abducted from way over the, the, the far end of the Strand, which is sort of right across the other, the other end on, on the ground floor. And he's marched at some speed from one end of the strand to the other end of the strand, hand in hand, walking out through this door. James has walked across here. And if you go there just before the canal bridge, there's a post office to your right hand side. They took him down there. So this would have been a really busy area. It's a busy entrance. James would have walked past lots and lots of shoppers. Denise had just to realise that James has gone missing. She'd be searching the neighbouring shops. She'd be asking people, have you seen my, have you seen my little boy? And be thinking he's there nearby, as everybody would. Yet the shocking thing for me is that it, well, it took just over one and a half minutes, one minute, 31 seconds, I think it was, to, from James being um, taken to actually leaving the strand. My name is Diane Halliwell, and at the time of the investigation, I was a press officer for Merseyside Police. Well, I was contacted about seven o'clock on Saturday morning. We did fax the media outlets. There's going to be a press conference at this time, at this place. Denise and Ralph, James's parents, were going to be there, and we'd give them an update on what the inquiry was so far. I met Denise and Ralph, who were destroyed sitting in the corner, very upset. I think Denise was chain smoking by that time. I 
I do remember the press conference. I didn't care about the cameras. I didn't care about the people behind the cameras. I was just more concerned about getting my voice out there to get James back. I wanted to let people know that he was mine, not theirs, and if you've got him, I need him back, I want him back. Just buying me some butchers. I'll turn to them for a minute and then I'll let Sarah go. Yeah. I went along with uh, other journalists to, to, to cover the, the press conference that morning. By that time, we were beginning to realise that something serious had happened. Um, but uh, obviously the full details were yet to emerge. We do have a number of video uh, photographs from the precinct itself showing the boy quite clearly apparently following two youths that we're very anxious to trace. It may well be that um, the child did follow them, so it is very important that we do trace these two boys. That moment, I think, when we went to that press conference and we were told that two boys had led James away and we were shown those images was when the whole dynamic of the story started to change again and we'd moved on from potentially a tragic accident to something more sinister than that. Denise, is it possible for you to tell us in your own words the sequence of events yesterday? When I lost him, you mean? I think one of the journalists said, um, what happened? And Denise looked confused and said, well, we were in the butchers. Do you mean when we were in the butchers, what happened? I let go of his hand for a second. And then she, she broke down, she started to cry. If you've got me baby, just come back. Just come well, thank you very much, Steve. In that, that circumstance, you're not nervous of cameras, you're not nervous, nervous of you, you're not, you're not nervous of anything. You just want one thing, and nothing else matters. Your first thought is, well, it's two kids taking him away. That, that's good, rather than sort of being an adult. Two children taking him off, perhaps they've taken him home, perhaps they've, they're, they're sort of taking him off to play or something like that, you know. How bad can it be? Um... Because they were clearly juveniles. I felt in my own mind, I don't know it was me being positive, that it's, it's likely to be less sinister than if it was an adult. You know, it, it might be a prank that's gone wrong. I remember thinking, oh, they've been taken by teenage boys. They look to be about 14, 15 year old to me. And I remember thinking, well, maybe they were taking him out to lead him somewhere, to take him to a place of safety. I thought, they've just taken him and we'll find him. We'll get, have a phone call to say he's been left at a house down the road or something. I really didn't believe that they were going to do him any harm. I felt relieved. I thought, I'm, I'm going to get him back here. There's no way they're going to be able to hurt him. They're too young to hurt him. I had every hope of getting him back. When I saw the images, it gave us something to go to. But it was confusing. So then I said, we know what we've got. We need a bit more. But that system wouldn't allow you then to track somebody through the strand as you would expect that you could do now. It had to be the same process of going through. I said, keep going and see what else we get. See how many other images we get and see whether we can track them, which way would they be going, what, what camera. Close-ups of the security photos don't reveal the youth's identities, but police say they're both white teenagers, one wearing a leather jacket. I'm Jonathan Munro, and at the time of the James Bolger murder, I was the North of England correspondent for ITN. In many ways, those images prompted a massive public uh, interest in the story, but of course, that also led to a lot of false leads. Throughout Saturday, it was just reacting to the, the high volume of information we had. There was enough, a lot of information coming in too much information for our team to process. You know, we, we had so many people coming forward, sightings in Chester, we had sightings in Stockport. 
We had sightings in the West Midlands. We had, you know, people who were genuinely uh, seeing the footage, genuinely trying to support the investigation. The log, uh, incident log, was inundated with people calling, volunteers calling to, you know, to search. People in Liverpool were very concerned about this. It was one of our own who'd gone missing, and you know we were all desperately worried about it. And everyone you met, it was you know it was the t first topic of conversation. That poor little boy. I hope he's all right. Everybody was was praying really for a happy resolution to the situation. Parents were keeping tight hold of their children today outside the shopping centre from where two-year-old James Bulger was apparently abducted. They were extremely concerned that the people who were taking him away on, on camera were obviously very young themselves and questioning about whether they were from the same community and who might they be. All day, police divers have been searching the Leeds Liverpool waterway. The already serious fears for James are increasing further as he faces his second night away from his parents. So far, the underwater search has been fruitless. But the fact that frogmen have been called in at such an early stage is an indication of the level of concern for his safety. Through that day then, we were really analysing everything that was coming in and looking at the CCTV. Well, we've got, you know, James, James being led away by two boys. Who have we got around them? We need to get those images out because we need to identify the people who are the witnesses because they're seeing them full on. But at the same time, our, our focus was on really searching. There were police everywhere in Bootle. They were searching the tunnels, the roads, the drains, the shops. You couldn't move without seeing police officers all very stern-faced, all very, very determined um, to make progress on this inquiry. I got a feeling it wasn't looking good as the days were going on. Um, I thought of two, two lads as, as um, what are they too scared to pass them back now because it's gone out there, you know, it's all, all over the news, all over the papers. You know, are they too frightened to now pass them back? I remember we were looking out the window and Denise said, there's a, um, a girl there or a, a boy there with a, a, a little child sort of thing. It could be James, so we had to send somebody out to, to see who it was, but it, obviously it wasn't James. She, she was just sort of clutching at straws by that time. So all these thoughts were going around in my head and at, in the end I didn't know what to think. All I wanted was to get him back safe and sound. It's now well over 30 hours since James went missing from this shopping centre. The already serious concerns for his safety have been further heightened as he faces his second night away from his parents. I sort of had this, this view that, you know, that he could still be found. Despite the fact that, that we'd, we'd seen him taken away, I really believed that we'd, we'd find James on Saturday. I really did. And then, uh, and then on a Sunday, they just said we need to go up to Walton Lane because uh, they found the body.
police officers combed waste ground near a reservoir this morning. A member of the public said she saw a boy like James with some youths here yesterday. Local residents were asked to check their gardens, but so far there's no sign of the missing toddler. We were informed of a missing child at 20 past four. At 20 past four, James was not far short of the reservoir. So at 20 past four, everybody is looking around in shops for a boy that's missing. And these boys, with purpose, with determination, with speed, are, are a mile away. We were told of the first significant sighting of James after uh, the Strand Shopping Centre, and that was him being seen uh, by a woman with two boys in the Breeze Hill area, uh, close to what was described as uh, an enclosed reservoir. One of the things that did strike me was that it did seem to be an extraordinarily long distance from uh, the Strand, and you begin to think to yourself, just how far have they taken him, and how did they manage to take him that far? That makes you start thinking, is there, an, is there another person involved? Because how could these two boys possibly have transported this little boy that distance in that space of time? And yet, there they were, just the three of them seen by the witness. We were still trying to understand what was their motivation. Who was telling them to do this? Was there someone else involved? What on earth were they doing? And where on earth was James? That was still very much the, the thought that was running through all our heads at this point. I decided that I would take Denise out in a police car and just give her some fresh air, basically, just to sort of keep her occupied for a while. Mandy said, come on, we'll go for a little drive round just to see if we can see him. And as we're driving round, Mandy gets it a call. We hadn't been out very long, actually. We were just sort of driving round Bootle. And I got a call saying, um, come back to the police station immediately and switch your radio off. So obviously I'm sitting next to her, so I'm hearing what's going on. And I went, how come you've been called back to the station? She went, I don't know. I went, you too. She went, I was home. She went, honestly, I don't know. I went, you too. I said, because I know. I said, they found him. And I knew, I knew then that he'd been found. And I knew it wasn't going to be good. Lying protected under a police tent, the body of a boy, found this afternoon by officers hunting for two-year-old James Bulger. The body was discovered on a railway line right next to a police station in Walton, Liverpool, over two miles from where he disappeared. They just said, you know, we need to go up to Walton Lane because uh, there's, a, there's a body on the railway. The, the scene was um, was kept contained, you know, on, on where there's a where there's a body like that. Uh, and I must admit, I I, I went assuming it was going to be. An accident, really did. Uh, very, very quickly, you know, you realise that it was certainly wasn't an accident. Inch by inch, the police have searched the railway line where two-year-old James Bulger's body was found. It had been spotted earlier by four schoolboys playing. And as you come out walking, you could just see it, just see it there as you looked on the floor, just right there, by the little path. 
because I said it was a baby. I was praying it wasn't James. I still wasn't convinced until I actually saw it in my own eyes. I've experienced most things in life, lots of tragedy. This was different, totally different, and you just couldn't put your finger on it as to why and why cause so many injuries. It must have been about four o'clock. My bleeper went off again, and I remember my husband thinking, oh, not again, you've already been out once today, what is it now? But then he knew, he said, that's not gonna be good news. I contacted force control room, and the words were found him. And I said, alive? No. And it was just no. Said, so you'd have to go and tell the family. Uh, people were coming in to see me, they were talking to me, but I couldn't hear a word they were saying. It's almost like someone places a veil over your face, a black veil, and you can't see beyond that veil. You, you hear voices, but you, you, don't, you can't hear the words. It's, it's an experience that I, I would never wish on my worst enemy. She let out this hmm. terrific scream and then just sort of... Um, just sort of collapse on in, in himself, but it was just terrible to hear. I just felt numbness. I was a mum without her baby. But even then, I was. I think I was still in denial. I think I thought, you know, they got it wrong. They, it, it, it can't. This can't be true. The ultimate objective was always to return James safe and well to the family. And, uh, yeah, the, the realisation that that wasn't going to happen was, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was devastating. People in Liverpool were very concerned about this, but the overwhelming sensation, the overwhelming emotion was one of shock and, you know, bitter disappointment, really, because the hope at that point evaporated. Everyone was hoping that this poor boy would be found safe, and then we knew for, for the first time that that wasn't going to be, be the case. A lot of the bobbies have got kids of their own. Everybody's lost their own kids at some time in a shopping centre or on the beach or something like that, so it could be anybody. And I think that was it. This could be any child, you know, it could have happened to anybody. I did go for the identification of James's body when um, James's uncle went to identify him. And he came out of the identification of broken man. An absolutely broken man. I, I think he thought she was tough enough to do it, and the realization of what he'd actually seen just it came out, and it, it was just speechless and broken. It was, it was terrible to see. The circumstances surrounding the way the body was left at that time, we couldn't really have an opinion on on what happened. What well, was clear though. You know, it was, uh, yeah, it was devastating, devastating injuries. Well, within a, an hour, Detective Superintendent Kirby address the whole team to say that the injuries that James had received, it was definitely not an accident. All evidence that pointed out to be a, a murder. 
Our job was to identify children in the area between 10 and 18 who had been involved in sort of assaults and violent behaviour. So once we had a positive identification, there was a lot of anger in the city. Who could do such a thing? Um, why haven't they been caught yet? Somewhere, some parent must know the time the children were out, the time they come back and the clothes they were wearing. It's got to be somebody must know. At this point, the gravity of what was occurring really struck home to everybody that here we had a situation where we knew two boys had led this toddler away from his mother in a shopping center. And here now, to, virtually two days later, we're confronted with uh, the news that his body's been found and he's been brutally murdered. And the question then is, could it have been the boys that did it? Or was there someone else involved? My name is Laurie Dalton. I was a detective constable for 26 years in Merseyside Police. So I was, I was called over and there's a conference at uh, a briefing, if you like, about what it's all about at Stanley Road Police Station. There's quite a few people there. We were all told at the conference that James had been found and now it was definitely a murder inquiry. Six o'clock on the um, Monday morning and then all hell broke loose. Phones constantly ringing and it was all hands on deck as well, just to deal with the constant barrage of uh, media inquiries. The blurred images of two youths seen taking James away are now all over the city. The public say detectives hold the key to finding them. You know, you have a situation where we see two boys taking James away. We don't know what's happened to James, but clearly it's going to be a bad situation. And as a result of that, the media are very, very quick to respond. The story became, who were the boys in the CCTV? That was what the police were focused on, that's what the media were focused on. And it led to um, a real suspicion uh, in the area about anybody who could have fitted that description. You saw children of James's age and maybe a little bit older being um, led by reins so that they, they couldn't run away. You saw them having their hands held incredibly tightly by their mums and their dads. We were working our way through any leads, the different photographs, the different images, working on the CCTV. It was bringing together all of those images, but there was so much going on. The, the, the images were such that you couldn't make out any detail. When I gave the description, I think I said something between 12 and 15. And then we were just looking at any child that was either flagged up through our own police systems, or somebody who could be either one of the, the boys. I think a lot of people were thinking, well, maybe it's this person or that person or this group of boys or that group of boys. It's natural because it's a vacuum and it's therefore being filled by uncertainty and, you know, frankly, gossip. There's nothing wrong with that in the sense that it's human nature, but it's a very, very difficult thing. People were looking at, at, you know, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old boys, just half thinking, I wonder. It was an area where there was a lot of children that had been in trouble with the police. And of course they were rounded up and they were interviewed. 
Oh, there was massive pressure on the police to solve it. Um, there wasn't a television bulletin or a newspaper in this country that wasn't leading on the James Bulger murder, and that is pressure. You know, there's no question about that. They were following up leads, tips, information from members of the public all over Merseyside and even beyond. I think over the course of the investigation, over 60 individuals, 60 boys, were either brought in for question or questioned. So I repeat the, the appeal that we've, we've made. Anyone, friends, family or whatever, you know, we must interview these two boys because if we don't, we can't guarantee anyone's safety until they've been arrested. You know, I wasn't concentrating on what was going on on the outside of Wales. You, you just don't know where you are. You, you don't know who you're talking to or you don't know what's going on. And Although you're getting told what's going on, nothing's sinking in. You just want to shut yourself away from the outside of Wales. I just locked myself in a room and you know, the, when I finally got to watch the news, I could see the, you know, how angry people were and, you know, I felt, I felt and I sensed the love for James in the city. One of the points in, in where James' body was found, that, that evidence meant that James had travelled, probably on foot, from the Strand to Walton Lane. The appeal went out to anybody within that route uh, uh, to come forward. There was a business called Amech on the corner of, of Hawthorne Road uh, at the roundabout with, uh, with Breeze Hill. They had a, a, a camera that was covering their car park and when the, um, when the owner returned to work, he had a look at it. He saw the images of, uh, of, of James with two boys walking past. When the images came back to us, there's a small wall, and we thought, that, that gives us a, a benchmark, maybe, for, for height. We thought that perhaps the height of the two boys who'd abducted James might be not as tall as that we might have considered. You know, it's not 100% because of the poor images, but we had to open our mind to the fact that instead of looking at a 12 to a 15 year old, you know, we might be dealing with smaller children here. It was difficult to consider that anybody could carry out those type of injuries to another individual, certainly someone as helpless as James. But the idea that it could be done by <coughs> juveniles or even children was, you know, it was off the scale. I was in Marsh Lane in the office going through some of the information that had come in and we got a breakthrough. I got a call from a police officer in, in Walton Lane who told me somebody had been into Walton Lane. I was a bit beside herself really. Uh, she'd been at a family friend's on, on Friday the 12th and, and their son, he'd come home <laughs> in a right mess, dirty bits of paint on his jacket and that he'd been sagging with another lad from the same school. 
he's only 10. He looks a bit like it could have been him on the foot on the footy, but you know, it's, it's probably not. That's all she said. I just want to let you know. And his name is John Venables. So we were constantly getting really good information from various sources, from you know, from people who had just seen people, from people who knew people. A neighbour, I believe it was, called in to say that she thought that John Venables might have had something to do with it. John had been out uh, playing truant on the day of the murder case, and he'd come home with his coat covered in paint. She said he went to St Mary's uh, School in, uh, in Bedford Road. So I got the, the number of the, uh, the headmistress. And she told me Bidwell's background, he hadn't been there that long. And, you know, I said to her, look, was John Venables at school on Friday? And she said, no, he was sagging with Robert Thompson. I said, can you tell me about the Thompson family, who she knew really well? Uh, the fact that he was a he was a persistent truanter. The Thompson family lived in a little village there, relatively close to to where James was found. So there was enough in that, really, to make me think mm, this is something that I need to look at a little bit closer. I select certain detectives if they come out in the morning, if they're available. Of course, they were quite eager. I said, well, we are going for two 10-year-old boys, so don't have your hopes up too much. I've arrested quite a few kids, but there's no way I could relate to a child actually committing a murder. They went to, to the home address as we, we had it from the school and, and his father was there and basically said that uh, <coughs> that John wasn't there but he was in his mother's address which was in Norris Green. And then a couple of members of the team went up to, to Norris Green, said, listen, this is why we're here. We want you to come to Low Lane, ask some questions, have you got the coat that you were wearing when you went, you know, when you were sagging on Friday. A few things were said, odd things, not necessarily admitting being in the strand, but I think Venable said uh, at one stage, you know, are you going to speak to Robert? Myself and the officers, the delegate office, go round to Thompson's house. I sent the CID lads, three of them round the back, I knocked on the door, the mother came to the door, I told him why I was there and I wanted to speak to Robert. And then I see Thompson and his eyes are everywhere and never did I ever see from the moment I met him to all the time I was dealing with him, with Phil and the other detective sergeant, did I ever see him in fear. I sit him down and I start speaking to him why I was there in simple kid's language and that I needed to take him from his house for him to answer some questions in the police station. That's when he started to cry. I got a call off Phil. I remember saying, Jim, these are, these, these are, these are little children. He said, uh, I can't consider that this little lad would do this. I couldn't believe a ten-year-old could cause so much suffering. So they were arrested at seven. 
The first interviews didn't take place until 5 p.m. There was a lot of work seeing and analysing what we already had. But from the first moments that they were, they were brought in, Venables' mother had said, and what Venables had said, he was going to say he wasn't in the Strand. We knew Venables had been in the Strand, even before we started interviewing them, that they'd been in the Strand. The boys were together. We knew they'd been together. We knew they were in the Strand. We knew we had the boys who had abducted James. He said that the two of you were in the strand and that you saw the little boy. He never. He never. But the God's honest truth. God's honest truth and I'm telling you that he never. There was a bit of evidence that, that was vital in, in how we developed our interview strategy and following uh, evidence we, re we got from this shop here, which was formerly the Bradford and Bingley Building Society. The manager reported to the police that on the morning of the 12th, two boys who they were 100% convinced were the same boys who abducted James, they were hanging about by the door and they had their fingers all over this pane of glass. So what the detective did when fingerprint and take all of the marks from all of the glass at the front. And as a result of, of, of those lifts, those fingerprint lifts, we were able then to match them immediately to John Venable's fingerprints. Despite what he said, he was in the Strand. When you interview a child, not only do you need all the evidence, but you have to prove that they know what's the truth, and that they know it's wrong, what they've done. So, right and wrong, truth or lies. This interview has been tape recorded. I'm Detective Sergeant Roberts. Now, what's your full name? Thompson. I then started interviewing and sort of getting involved in the story, what they were doing that day. I'm Dominic Lloyd. I was Robert Thompson's solicitor at the time of the case. A solicitor arriving at a police station can normally expect to do a lot of waiting. In this case, there was none of that. We started work straight away because that's the only work that was being done there. It was a small interview room. So just picture it. Table, wall, and the tape machine. To my left was Robert Thompson. What do they call you, Robert or Bobby? Robert. I think Bobby's a, a more friendly name, do you agree? Yeah. You've got a social worker and a defence solicitor. And then you've got two big burly detective sergeants all in a room. He wasn't frightened. He wasn't phased by any of it. Some people might say because he didn't understand what was going on. He knew what was going on. I just want to know a little bit about you now, OK? What's your hobby then? Skipping school. <laughs> Skipping school, is that right? That's our hobby. That's a profession, Bobby, when you do it as well as you. 
I really could not bring myself to believe that he had any involvement in this. Just from his youth, just from how small, how young, how childlike he was. Bobby, I came out to your house this morning, didn't I? Yeah. And um, what did I say to you? Listen. Correct. What for? James. James, what, what about James? That you said no suspicion of murdering. Well, very well remembered. Robert Thompson's interviews, he admitted quicker he was in the stand. I think at one stage, really early on, he says he saw James with his mother. Did you ever see him in the strand? You shook your head again. Yeah. Bobby, was that on the day that we're talking about? Was that on Friday. this Friday? Yes. Yeah. yeah. We were going up the escalators, never were coming through. The doors have to slow us off. Who was he with? Bill. Little James. His mum. With his mum. And then his interviews quite quickly get to the stage where he has uh, John taking his hand and, and taking him out. He was just running around, was he, James? Yeah. Will you tell me exactly what, slowly, right? He just said, come here. And then he, he grabbed his hands and walked up to stand by the day. I think it's... Marks and Spencer shop. Right. I didn't think the water. Look at the canal bridge. The boy was streetwise. He was quite clever. Well, you were with John all the time, weren't you? Yeah. Not all the time, because we were running in front of each other. Yes, but he did he. Did he go out all the James? I don't know. You don't know? He might have made them follow on behind us. Did he? And then got him lost somewhere. That was one thing about Robert Thompson. He was quite confident in himself. He was streetwise, thought he was clever, but he didn't show really any anxiousness. All he was waiting for was to go home. I don't think he recognised the fact that what he'd done was that bad. How did he come up to, to John? How did he come up to John? James. No, he was walking down the strand. Who was? James? The baby. Was he? I told him to take him back. You did what? I told him to take him back. You told him to take him back? I'm not right, playing. No, so you're not right getting all the blame. I was just asking your son. I'm yeah. trying to find out too. Will you feel me the blame? Wait a minute, Bobby. Listen. Yeah. Once he admitted coming out of the strand with James, that, that was that was a great breakthrough. Well, you were in the stand at the same time the baby was there, yeah, weren't you? you said that we took the baby. No, I didn't say that you took the baby. I don't know what it was like education-wise, but he was switched on. Definitely switched on. And he was trying to calm me. Trying very hard. Did well, you, you said we, we were with the baby? No, no. I you said me. that... No, just a second. Listen to me, Bobby. We knew, even before we started interviewing them, that they'd been in the Strand, because the, the fingerprints on Bradford and Bingley uh, put them there. And he said that you took him by the hand and led him out of the Strand shop. We never. He was a liar. Calm down. Oh, my gosh. All right, all right, come on. Though. At the end of interview three, we tell him that Robert Thompson has already told us that he's been in the Strand. And then he admits being in the Strand. So you were in Bootle in Strand? Yeah, was you in Bootle Strand? We never got a kid, Mum. We never. We never got Mrs. a kid. Uh, I, I must ask you not to get angry with him. I never got the boy. I never killed him, Mum. And then he admits, yeah, being with James, and, and then 
taking taking James. So we walked up to him and we were walking around with him and I took his hand. And whose idea was it to walk towards him? Mine. Was it? Then it was Robert's idea to kill him. That's when I felt sort of boom. You get a bit of a thud thinking, oh my god, we have got the right kids. They wanted blood. They really did. I think they'd have ripped them to pieces. It was a deep, deep shock that something like that could have happened in this country. It's hard to really. I still know I can't really fathom think about exactly what happened. I'm not going to stop at this. I am going to keep fighting for my son. He's not here to defend himself, so I'm going to do it for him. The forensic evidence was chilling. The youngest defendants to face murder charges this century arrived at Preston Crown Court this morning. And you just kept on getting back up again. You wouldn't stay down. For everyone who says, you know, should let it go, why should I let it go? I'm never going to let this go. It was my son that they took. We hear more from James's brothers as Lost Boy, the killing of James Bulger, concludes tomorrow night at nine. Next Wednesday at nine, we ask, what turned a 17-year-old girl into a sadistic serial killer? Rose, making a monster, is brand new. 19-year-old Elizabeth baffles the experts. Next, she goes from size 6 to 16 in 18 months. It's Extraordinary Medical Mysteries.